Hey guys, welcome back. I uh, was going to go over that, um, that picture we put up in the community channel with the crank sensor and cam sensor waveforms that was uh, uh, a no start on a 2000 Chevrolet. Uh, that was a 5.3 VIN T vehicle. The, um, <clears throat> for those who are following along at least. Um, okay, so I left it up for a while. I ran through some comments and I think there was a little bit of a confusion with some of the guys. They weren't sure if the if this was like uh, the truck was fixed or not fixed or whatever. I, I never got back. Uh, I've been doing a lot of other stuff. I've been busy, but I wanted to get back to this. So I'm going to try to cut this short as possible. Okay, so I don't know if all of your questions are going to be answered here, but I'm going to do the best I can to uh, to clarify, okay? Reading through the comments, some of you guys had great ideas, and you were right on the money. On uh, some of you were right on the money on what to do next. Okay, our next step. Some of you were unclear on um, you know direction, I guess. And uh, part of it's my fault. I did not clarify one thing that I should have. When you crank the engine in this truck, it was not erratic. So the cranking uh, cadence on this thing was not all over the place. Uh, meaning it was you know speeding up, slowing down. You didn't have any of that. So with that said, this was a steady crank, uh, did not sound like it was out of time or anything to that effect, and that is the pattern that we had on the crankshaft signal. Also, that was not uh, necessarily repeatable in the sense that it was every 720 degrees it happened at a certain point. Uh, say that you had a broken reluctor, you know, a piece of it broken off or something to that effect or whatever, you know, just for instance, that would be a repeatable pattern that you would have. This was not repeatable. This was just literally all over the place and erratic. Um, <clears throat> now, the reason I did this, obviously, because you guys liked the last one that I did. And, you know, some of you had, you know, commented that it made, made you think. It, you know, you like this kind of thing. So I figured I'd try it one more time with this one. Um, I, I like the ideas you guys have here of uh, get a known good signal. You have to know what good looks like to see, uh, you know, to pick out a bad one. Uh, I can tell you from experience with these trucks, that is absolutely a bad signal. Uh, you know, 100%, there's, there's a problem in that crank signal. What is it? Uh, well, some of you guys said, you know, check the wiring harness, check for, you know, uh, load test power and ground. That's great. You know, fair enough. Uh, that stuff is obviously something you would want to do. From my experience seeing this kind of a signal, uh, you know, it is being pulled all the way to ground. Uh, that's one thing that you have to be insightful with, you know, pay attention to if the voltage is, is going all the way to ground. Um, that may be an indication, if it's not, that you have a problem in the circuit. Uh, this, to me, right off the top of my head, when I looked at it, looked like an air gap issue, all right, being that I had a, a steady crank speed. So, some of the guys recommended do I you know do I have they well they asked the question or recommended check spark uh you know check compression check uh fuel pressure check injector pulse valid okay granted I didn't the reason I didn't is because um in certain circumstances one test will lead you past doing that okay um <clears throat> this truck this truck absolutely did not run, absolutely set a PO335. What I wanted to do was seeing that crank signal and knowing the history, okay, and that's, that's another important thing. The, the, last, the shop that sent it to us, that worked on it, had sent us uh, you know, the truck with the information that they put a crank sensor in it due to the PO335. The truck was towed to them, though. The truck never ran, okay, so they never had it running and screwed something up, and it never ran. Broke down on the customer, the owner. They towed it to the shop. That shop went in with a scan tool, diagnosed the PO335 as the fault, put a crank sensor in it, still have a fault, and that was where it ended for them. They sent it to us. Now, they do not have a scope at their shop, so for them to... <clears throat> sorry. For them to be able to verify signal integrity, they really can't. Uh, not, you know, they don't have the... They don't have an oscilloscope, so that's the first thing that I wanted to do. I cleared the codes, I cranked it, I wanted to see what it did from the driver's seat. It did have an RPM signal in the driver's seat though at the scan tool, okay? I did have an RPM signal. So, and that, that does make sense because if you look at the pattern, I do have a signal. Is it a good signal? That's a different story. 
but it was obviously enough of a, you know, a signal good enough to uh, present RPM on the scan tool. So the computer saw RPM. Uh, but my, my point being, I did not check other things at this point because I, have, uh, I know for a fact I have something broken here. So I need to verify my concerns on that uh, first before I move on to anything else. I wanted to see a clean signal on the crankshaft uh, sensor before I moved on to any other diagnostic testing, okay? So my, uh, as some of you guys had said, my next step was to go to the sensor itself. Getting to the sensor on these, if for those that don't know, this is not mounted in the front of the engine uh, where, the, where the crankshaft, uh, where, the, where the harmonic balancer is. This is located in the back of the engine, or on, well, on the right side of the engine block, and it's buried behind the starter. So you cannot get to this thing without pulling the starter. Uh, it's like a Dodge 4.7 and some other motors that are out there that are designed. It's, it's just a crap design in my opinion. That was my logical next step to get to the bottom of the crank signal. So pull the starter out and I did test the wiring and I did test the signal down at the at the uh, crankshaft uh, sensor itself as well as at the computer. So that was the same signal. Okay, either way it didn't matter. Uh, wiring integrity was good. Load tests were good. I had no issue with the circuit. So now that those tests were done, and this is, you know, again, getting to the problem as quickly as we can, right? I don't want to waste time putting a fuel pressure gauge on a truck that I obviously know has a crank signal problem. So I, I go to, um, at that point, take the, se the sensor out. And what I noticed, and I'm going to look and see if I have the photos still or not uh, to show you guys, there was an insane amount of rust built up where the sensor actually sat flush against the block. So this thing, the sensor is about that long, has an O-ring that it will seal when it goes inside the block, right? And then it will sit, you know, it has to sit flush against the block here. There's a standoff, so to speak, right, or shoulder. Um, I saw, I mean, it was visible. There was plenty of rust built up there. So when I looked at it uh, closer, I realized that the sensor was not actually in all the way first of all, so there's my air gap issue, and I wanted to take it out now absolutely and, and go over it and see if, you know, what it was. Upon further inspection, I noticed a crack where the plug goes into the sensor. That was probably done uh, when they installed it because they couldn't get it in, and I know that because I couldn't get it out. When you install one of those sensors new, you know, after you do it the right way, clean it up, uh, clean the block, put it in, uh, put a little lubrication. I like to use the uh, I like to use the castor oil uh, for AC systems. The castor oil spray, that's incredible for O-rings. It preserves them, and it's a very very slick lubricant that works well. Uh, that's what I prefer to use. This thing had a little grease on it. That's you know I found some remnants of grease where they tried to slide it in. Um, <clears throat> didn't work out great because the rust was never cleaned. So, Playing around, playing around, drill it. Uh, I've tried all the, I mean, I, you know, it's easy to say like, oh, you should have did this. Guys, I know the tricks. I've been around this for a long time. I know the tricks, okay? Heat something up to shove in there, a screw, whatever, pull it out, trust me. This thing was not coming out. This thing was wedged tighter than, forget it. It, it wasn't coming out. Um, I had to break it to get it out. I had to drill it on both sides. I, I drilled two sides and I got in there with uh, needle nose pliers that are angled and I was able to twist it and finally break it and pull pieces of it out and I did get the entirety of it out, which is the goal. Um, point being that when, what, I, what, I'm gonna, what I'm trying to get at is I know for a fact this thing was not incorrectly because of the rust. When I first initially took the bolt uh, out that retains the sensor. They're, they have a steel retainer that with a hole in it that the bolt goes through. When I pulled that out, that actually sprung back off the block. So that was telling me that there was backwards tension pushing off of the uh, off of the bolt, off the retainer, because it was not flush. When you take the bolt out, that thing should never move. It should be flat against the block where the mounting surface is. This was pushing back. So I had a battle with it. Again, it's a tight you know, engine to work with where it is, and it's a pain in the ass, so we got it out, whatever, it is what it is, part of the job. Um, then it became very evident that inside of the hole where the O-ring seals was nothing but rust, and that is probably why the sensor was cracked, because they forced it or banged on it to get it into the hole as far as they could. We see it all the time with ABS sensors, that's more common, 
uh, with air gap issues because somebody will change a sensor and they'll put it into a spindle that is full of rust and it'll never bottom out completely and then they'll say the code is still there that didn't fix it we put a sensor in it that's why it didn't fix it most of the time um, <clears throat> the air gap is huge okay it has to be right so with that said uh, this this was not a difficult diagnosis okay it was a little bit more of a pain in the ass type job because of uh, obvious reasons getting it apart uh, you know that sort of thing a lot of rust and you know a lot of cleaning involved to get everything right it makes a difference obviously I mean it's thousands of an inch it's not a lot of times it's not something you would ever see by eye either but this was very obvious that it was not done properly the other thing that I'm gonna tell you too is the sensor that they put in they told me was some sort of no-name brand uh, and I, I, I'm not making that up like I'm telling you they don't even know what brand it was there's some off like white box junk uh, that they paid 20 bucks for or whatever so it was a cheap sensor that was installed but I don't believe that the cheap sensor had to do with my reading uh, on this on the waveform okay I don't believe that at all that was just all over the place that was air gap um, would the sensor have worked had they done it right and cleaned it right I, I don't know maybe it would have maybe it would have been perfect Maybe it would have had a better signal and it still wouldn't have run right. Maybe it would have had misfires. I couldn't tell you because by the time I got that sensor out of there, it was in 30 pieces. But I replaced it with an AC Delco original equipment sensor because I don't, I'm not doing that job twice. I'm not going in there for a cheap part um, and pulling the starter back out and playing around. I, you know, and I know you guys, uh, some of you guys out there like to flame me for saying that I like to use OE parts. Talk to any of the good shops, man. They don't use cheap parts. There's a reason. Um, in this situation, I'm not saying that it wouldn't have worked. I'm just saying that I'm not taking the risk of doing that job twice for no reason, for being cheap. So I put the new sensor in. Uh, this is obviously the waveform that we got after the new sensor was installed. And you can see the difference in the clarity. You can see the, you can see the uh, uniform, this, you know, the uniform across the sensor. Is not, it's not erratic or all over the place, okay, as opposed to the last one I just showed you. Um, that's it. So what I'm also going to try to do is, um, hopefully, hopefully I could find a picture of the sensor and I'm going to put it up here as well, somewhere in the video where it fits in. And I'll show you what I'm talking about, about the metal retainer that's built into the sensor. And you can see what I'm talking about. That will sit flush against the engine block where it mounts. Okay. Um, so I hope this clarified some of the stuff for you guys, some of the questions you had about it and what you, know, what you guys were theorizing about. My point of doing these kind of videos here is to make people think, uh, this truck is long gone, by the way. This truck was fixed weeks ago. It's, it's, you know, it's a non-issue. Um, it's nothing like we couldn't figure it out or we were asking for help. I'm just putting that out there, okay? Uh, the, the point is that I, I tried this once before playing around and you guys seem to like it, so I thought it would make guys that do not do this for a living think a little bit. And I, and I know some of you guys are not familiar with a scope or what you're supposed to be seeing so that to you could be normal. That's why I'm explaining it and that's why I'm showing you in the video the pictures of before and after and all the stuff and we're going through it. Uh, once again, I talk too much and I ramble and that's just me. Um, I try to be thorough and I usually find that after the fact that I forgot I wanted to say something else. I do the best I can. I don't have a script. Um, if you guys have questions re pertaining to this vehicle or anything that I missed, put them in the comments. I'll be happy to answer. I, as you guys know, I do try to answer everyone uh, you know, on YouTube. I try to respond and interact with everybody on here. And I, I will do so as long as, you know, as long as humanly possible. I will absolutely always do that. Uh, you know, it gets harder. I think as the channel, um, you know, if the channel grows, I think it gets harder to do that and it becomes a point where you can't possibly, unless you're doing this full time, you can't possibly answer every question. And I know I miss things sometimes too, but I, I do my best to try to interact uh, and answer for you guys. Uh, you know, if I put something out there, I feel like I owe to you uh, an explanation if you have a question about it, if I'm obviously able to answer it. So that's it, guys. Uh, any other questions, just please put them in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell uh, for more videos, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks.